So my name is uh, Fernando Culaco. It's actually a Culasso, but I dropped the, the complicated part of the name a few years ago because people kept calling me 10 different names. So now it's just Culaco. Um, so uh, I'm in Beijing. This is now my eighth, almost ninth year in, uh, in China. Uh, but I'm actually from Portugal. Uh, so uh, Culaco Tech is based in Beijing. Uh, but I won't do any any kind of sales pitch. Uh, I'll just go through a, a few uh, things that uh, what happened and what we did uh, during COVID because uh, I was crazy enough to decide to open a company here exactly when the pandemic started. Uh, so, uh, and we'll go through that. I'll just uh, rewind a little bit uh, on my background because that will kind of fit the context on the um, on the rest of the presentation. Uh, so can you still hear me? I just want to be sure the yes, the yes, everything, everything okay. is fine. <laughs> okay, you just disappeared. I just wanted to be sure. Don't, don't anyway, worry. So I started with the computers and uh, interested in computers and that kind of stuff uh, quite a while ago uh, in the dark ages. Uh, there was not even PCs. Uh, I'm sure uh, if there's someone older in the audience will recognize this thingy the Sinclair Spectrum. Uh, and I had one uh, which I bought, I took one year to pay it, actually my father took one year to pay it, but I didn't like games or anything. I was really interested in how to make games and uh, how to make programs. And this is way before internet, which means that you have to spend like, uh, go to the library, bring like a huge books, uh, two kilos each. Uh, and there was no copy paste. So you basically have to type what you see on those books and pray that everything works because most often there will be some typo on the, on the, on some page. And that's how you learned actually. You had to fix what someone, uh, <laughs> did wrong on the book. Uh, it happened a lot. But anyway, moving on because this part should be fast. So, uh, that, uh, when I was a, a kid, I was 13, 14 or something like that was just as a hobby and I was just learning and I was just interested. But uh, soon enough, uh, a couple of years later, I started making some money out of the, making some um, uh, point of sales uh, software, uh, logistics software for MS-DOS. Again, uh, only people old enough <laughs> will remember that. Uh, and using C and Pascal at the time, it was not even C++, but uh, moving on, no geek topics needed. And then uh, in 2003, I'd, uh, I was already working and I was already at, at plenty of projects and clients to work with. But uh, in Portugal, the, um, well, the, the prices of software were really low. Uh, and either if I continued freelancing or if I wanted to, uh, to work in a company, the salaries there were not that great either. So in 2003, uh, after saving some money, I just left Portugal and I ended up going to Switzerland where I stayed uh, for a while. And uh, when I arrived, it was interesting because uh, I'm from Portugal. So the only job offers were basically cleaning and construction. Uh, and I got tired of uh, going to interviews uh, and uh, even with my portfolio and my CV, which had nothing to do with that, the, the job offers were always the, the same. So I decided to, to take my uh, nationality out of the CV. Uh, and next day, either because of that or because uh, I was a lucky bastard for some reason, uh, I landed a job as an art director at uh, Young and Rubicum. So from cleaning uh, and construction uh, job proposals to uh, uh, a multinational advertising agency. So I spent three years in advertising and the marketing and design related, but I was missing the other part, which is the, the technical part. We did some interactive stuff. Uh, web was kind of still new at the time. We, we also did some marketing campaigns for the web, but uh, I was missing the technical software development part. So after three years of uh, advertising craziness, uh, I resigned and I joined uh, the opposite. So I went to a finance company as a software uh, development manager and there was no design in there. So uh, no creative part in there was completely dead. So what I did uh, three years after, again, I resigned and I decided to start freelancing. Uh, and that happened for two years. Uh, I'm sure everyone remembers 2008. 
Uh, and that was shortly after I left the finance company, so good timing. Uh, so uh, what happened in 2008, I will come back to this because what is happening right now is very similar and uh, there's a lot of crap happening, but there's a lot of uh, opportunities emerging and uh, people have to pivot, people have to adapt if they want to thrive. And when I say people, that's clients, that's consumers, that's uh, companies, that's everything. So again, uh, at the time, uh, everything went wrong, but it was actually my best business uh, year, right? Uh, the, the several years after that, and we'll get to there because then I'll compare that with COVID times because the same happened. So finishing my the most boring part, which is this about me section. So I left Portugal, I moved to Switzerland, but after two years in there, uh, I was thinking, okay, I'm freelancing. Uh, why the hell am, am I in the most expensive country, the highest taxes, if most of the time I'm not even um, in Switzerland because I was always traveling because of clients, because of conferences somewhere always between Switzerland, UK, Italy, uh, Germany, uh, and the Netherlands. So I decided, okay, so I'm closing the company here. I'm going to start traveling full time. Uh, and I will change country every three months or four months. Uh, and that's what happened for four years and a half, uh, more or less. Uh, that's what I was doing. And half the way I was convinced, okay, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life because I can work from anywhere uh, anyway. I can do most meetings through Skype and most of the business is dealt by email. Uh, and that's what happened. So what the photo you see in here is like part, a little part of all the train tickets and airplane tickets and map uh, drafts. But one thing happened uh, when I arrived in China where I'm still here, uh, after uh, the plan, the original plan was still to keep going and switch country every three, four months. Usually uh, in whatever country, I, I would only decide the next country like on the, the last week. Uh, and China, I was already in China briefly, but it was just for a couple of days because I did three Trans-Siberian trips uh, on, on the same year. But uh, after one month in China, I was starting to think, mm, I think I'm going to spend at least uh, six months or maybe one year here. Well, before three months, I already knew I was not going to leave. Uh, I'll get to the why. And again, now I get back to 2008 and comparing 2008 with uh, now. This screen is a little bit uh, on the scary side. Uh, but anyway, moving on. Uh, so uh, in China, I was mostly continuing to do the, the same. So freelancing, of course, technology changes, the services I offer, I offer kept changing. I experiment with a lot more stuff, not just uh, equipment, uh, but also um, concepts because things here change really fast. You can test ideas very fast because population is uh, huge. And even if you just hit 0.1% of the audience, that's that's thousands or even millions of people sometimes. So uh, it's an interesting market to play around with. Uh, but I was mostly freelancing, but uh, Sometimes for a year or six months, I would work in a company, sometimes startups, some, sometimes uh, large companies, uh, mostly for visa reasons. Uh, and what happened in, um, so two years ago, uh, when COVID, when COVID eats everyone. Uh, so I was close to one year in, a, uh, it's actually a big company and most of you know it, but I cannot tell the name because I'm probably going to say a lot of shit about it. Uh, <laughs> doesn't matter. It was just a large company, the typical company where the teams are too big and uh, they cannot work with each other. They, they basically fight each other, too many management levels. So I, I was already feeling I was waiting, wasting my time and I was anyway just saving money to, to open my company. And I was planning to do it in one year or two. But then the COVID changed everything uh, on the positive way. Uh, and now let's go to that. So that's the main, uh, so this is the main section. Now, uh, so this is a, a Chinese um, proverb uh, that I really always liked, uh, but now it fits really well in this uh, context. Uh, and uh, I'll try. Fang xiang zhuan bian shi, you ren zhu xiang, you ren zhao feng shi. Which means, uh, after my short uh, Chinese show off, if there's Chinese people in the audience, the, they will say my tones were crap anyway. 
so when the winds change, some build walls while others build windmills. And I really like this uh, proverb because uh, what happened two years ago uh, and what's still happening in the West, uh, Europe and the US, because markets are still shaking and adapting here, things are basically back to normal. But uh, this is exactly the, the case because companies, startups or big ones that were shaky, uh, they got screwed up. Uh, so the company where I was, they just fired 2,000 something people across the all offices. In ours, it was like 300 people and my entire team basically uh, was fired. I was not, but uh, I was managing a team and I asked my, uh, my, uh, my managers, uh, what are we going to do now that uh, you just fired the, the best people on the team? Uh, and I didn't get a reply for that. Uh, and then I started immediately thinking, okay, I need to get out of here and uh, just grab these guys before, before they find another job. And this is the timing, the right timing for opening a company, actually. Uh, and we'll see why. Uh, so, again, aside from the fact that companies that are not prepared for these situations, well, most of them closed, uh, including big, big ones, but... Uh, a lot of startups just uh, just went down immediately, uh, and even some solid companies, not big companies, but uh, normal businesses. So it's it's just a matter of seeing that uh, there are always opportunities in the middle of uh, all the the messy situations. It doesn't need to be a, a virus. It doesn't need to be uh, anything like this. It can be anything. Uh, and actually, some of these opportunities uh, would not even exist uh, without these situations, and we'll go through a few. So this is more of a storytelling of um, how I tried and uh, what worked and what did not uh, to thrive uh, in the middle of uh, the COVID thing. So here, uh, again, my company, uh, it's only two years old. So again, it started exactly when the virus uh, when the cases started appearing here, it was a mess. Uh, in here, it was all of uh, more of a surprise and uh, we were still figuring out what was going on. Uh, the West had more time to prepare. Some countries did not, <laughs> but uh, including mine. But um, basically we opened, um, uh, so shameless uh, sales pitch moment. Not really, I'm not going through case studies or clients or anything, but that's enough. So we basically are doing what I did before. So all kinds of, uh, so we are um, a creative and a tech agency. So we do anything that involves design or uh, custom software development or both in most of the projects, most of the clients, most of the cases, both B2B, B2C. Uh, these are some current and some old clients. I basically bring my uh, older clients to start the company because I didn't want to start neither with investors, neither with uh, loans. So it was basically just uh, some money I got when, um, when I left the debt company. I was not fired, but I did all, all things possible to get fired. And it worked in two or three days. I just said to the manager things that they didn't like to listen. It works usually. So uh, let's go now to something I already mentioned, which is uh, hidden advantages uh, that, again, uh, won't happen in any other times. So the first one, uh, and here, so this one, uh, I'm not good at pointing at things on the other side of the screen, doesn't matter. So if it wasn't for COVID, uh, for sure, I wouldn't be able to get um, an office uh, in a courtyard in the center of, the, of Beijing. Uh, so this is actually our uh, company, our courtyard, and it's next door to one of the biggest shopping centers. So rather than being in the um, tech company district, which is in the middle of nowhere, like 20 something kilometers from the center and clients always complain it's too far away and not convenient. Uh, I wanted to, uh, to do it in the city center. And how to get that? Well, it's quite simple. Uh, so as I said, small companies, small offices, uh, are closing left and right. And you take advantage of one thing, which is landlord panic because, so in this courtyard where I am now, uh, basically all the offices, uh, there are six offices, they all closed. Three of them were travel agencies. So they were dead in the water immediately. Uh, and of course I started uh, 
contacting uh, these kind of places in the city center because I also live, live nearby. Uh, and uh, it was basically a game of trying to find the landlord <laughs> in, uh, with the, the most panicking landlord I could. And basically then it's negotiating prices because they know they are not going to, to, to get uh, anyone in the offices anytime soon. Uh, and second part, which is important, negotiate that took longer than negotiating the price negotiating the the duration of the contract so the ideal would be three four years i i got it for five years so obviously now that things are back to normal for more than one year uh, one year and a half uh, all the other offices that got a cheaper price uh, when i started also uh, here they are like uh, 10 times more expensive than uh, well than last year mine is still the same and we will still be for another three years let's see what I'll do after. So the other very important thing uh, is during, and again, this is uh, deja vu from 2008. At the time I was a freelancer. Now I'm just the same, but expanded with the team uh, with more or less the same um, uh, skills. And uh, uh, I'll go through the team later. But basically what happened is a lot of companies uh, fired. Um, so with the mass layoffs, they fired most of their teams, in some cases, they fired their entire teams uh, or the, the companies they outsourced uh, went bankrupt or in closed doors. So the market really gets a lot of demand immediately. Uh, and uh, this applies for my, my market and for many other markets. Uh, so uh, companies start outsourcing more to agencies uh, or service providers and even freelancers. Again, in 2008, when I said it was my best business uh, year, it was exactly the, the same situation. So again, I'm seeing history repeating here. So I was just, well, repeating the formula of the, the things that actually worked. So then second part, there was a large demand uh, for new kinds of apps. So for example, online delivery. So whatever restaurants didn't have online delivery started having, again, in China, that was not a big impact because uh, that was already quite solid and still is. Uh, the only thing is there were some adaptations on those apps. For example, the, the app shows the temperature uh, of, the, of the delivery guy. Uh, so very quickly, they had to come up with new things. And one thing that started working immediately in here and much, much later in Europe, uh, in some countries only, was the scanning QR codes uh, for, um, well, for, uh, for creating a, a database of... Uh, uh, who who goes to what places and uh, so if there's a case uh, the the authorities know immediately who was there on uh, in the space of one day uh, and basically it's to link peoples with uh, people with places and that was very effective because even uh, now it's rare but even when there's a, a spike it's under control in, in less than one week basically because of that, because you can pinpoint uh, who who was with uh, whom and uh, where and when. Uh, but again, then there was a lot of demand of this kind of apps. Uh, and again, uh, a food delivery app, it's not much different uh, from uh, e-commerce. It's just uh, the timing is different. Uh, but all of a sudden, there was a lot of uh, uh, overseas customers that were needing uh, uh, delivery uh, apps, uh, delivery services. So the entire infrastructure, not just the app and the design and whatever, all the server stuff, uh, et cetera. Uh, and this happened with restu individual restaurants. This, this happened with um, municipalities uh, in Portugal. So the entire town or entire city wanted to have a system for their restaurants, well, to survive on this new market. Uh, so there was a lot of demand uh, on the, this kind, well, the service I provide and many others. So again, these are uh, things that just uh, appear uh, uh, on these situations. This next one is quite obvious. So uh, so basically, companies that that were that had no presence at all in the digital world uh, in e-commerce. They had a choice to survive, either, e either implementing uh, e-commerce or, uh, well, or closed doors because uh, we, we all know what happened uh, and uh, whoever didn't convert uh, to digital, uh, well, either, lo either lost, uh, lost a lot of money or just closed doors. 
So again, more service demand, more um, including new services that uh, appeared out of nowhere. One thing that was very um, had a lot of demand here in China was remote work. Um, and that's interesting because in China, remote work was not very uh, welcome uh, normally. Uh, for example, in the company where I was before, uh, uh, when I was dealing with visa stuff and I had to travel, and uh, even when I came back, I, I couldn't be in the company before my visa was issued, I was working remotely, which for me was completely normal. But the entire management for them, uh, they were surprised that work was being done because for them, remote work is basically expecting me to be at home waiting and doing nothing. So one thing that had a huge demand is how to do uh, remote work efficiently. And this was not for employees. It was, this was mostly for managers because for them, this was kind of a completely alien idea. Uh, well, and then had to become normal very quickly and they were just not familiar with uh, what to do. So again, it's just a matter of uh, picking the complicated things, trying to make some sense out of them and find solutions because there'll be all kinds of problems, obviously, appearing from these situations. It will affect all markets, basically. Uh, some of them harder than, than others, like tourism. But uh, there's always problems needing to be solved and there's always ways to solve them. So. Uh, again, this just opens a lot of uh, markets and opportunities. So one of the other uh, advantages, and this was huge for me to open the company at this time. Again, so mass layovers. So all of a sudden, there's a lot of talented people uh, outside without a job. Uh, most important also is that some of these uh, are people that are really good at their job and maybe they were stuck in a big company. And here it, it was very common, like in uh, Douyin, which you know as TikTok, uh, Alibaba, whatever. So these are huge companies. They have too many people. They, In some cases, they have like 10 people, but uh, only two are actually doing uh, significant work. Uh, because again, the, the salaries are probably not uh, that great. We're far away from the China with the low salaries from 30 years ago. Uh, actually, salaries are quite decent, but uh, they, they are, these big companies, the salaries are still worse than uh, a normal uh, smaller company or even a startup. The reason people don't leave it is they get in their comfort zone uh, and they get used to routine. Uh, and sometimes even their families don't want them to leave because they are in a prestigious big uh, company. And there's no way to hire those people, even if you offer a crazy salary. Uh, so uh, all of a sudden, even from my company, that was the, the first thing, uh, I was immediately chasing the, the best people on my team. Uh, and then later, I also hired someone I met before in another project, uh, uh, a really good developer that would be impossible to recruit before. But this company uh, went bankrupt. So again. So this is actually uh, our company. This is when we started. We were only uh, four. Now we're seven and another two in Portugal. But those will even move to China. Well, when traveling is normal again uh, and it's easier to take care of visas and everything. So again, uh, I just wanted to keep the agency environment because uh, that was one of the most um, even if you are software developers, uh, for designers it's normal, but even software developers are in more uh, in a more relaxed environment than the usual cubicle uh, uh, in a corner and uh, a farm of uh, computer geeks, which is kind of boring. I'm a software developer myself, and I hate that. So, so out of these, because uh, I think everyone learned, uh, especially during the last two years. And things are still quite rough uh, in the West. Uh, and uh, But there's a lot of lessons here. And uh, here we, we don't have any problems right now. Uh, things are back to normal for quite a long time. But I'm implementing things on the company that uh, to, because it can be an earthquake or another virus or a, ver a variant of the virus that resets everything and we start all over again. Let's hope not. But uh, first thing is getting people used to work at home, but efficiently. It's not uh, playing games or sleeping. Uh, but some things are actually the management 
fault, which I saw in too many companies doing the same mistakes. And that's the last photo in the bottom. It's basically, uh, so people are working from home, let's micromanage them and uh, do meetings every five minutes with everyone and then expect them to get work done. That doesn't work either. So having a good, it's, it's not just uh, working from home. So it has to come from the office for people to continue working efficiently at home uh, normally. So that starts already in the company itself. Because again, one thing I keep seeing in large teams and small teams in small companies, big companies, especially between design and UI team and the development team, it's just a, a game of ping pong. So the design team does something awesome. They pass it to the developer team. They start already finding excuses on the developer team. So they cut half of the things. Sometimes it makes sense, but sometimes it's just uh, laziness. Uh, and it's bad enough uh, that way. It's worse when the management doesn't understand anything about what they are managing. Uh, so then it's just a blind war between two teams or 10 teams, depending on how complicated the company structure is. So if this is bad already at the office, this will be a thousand times worse uh, if uh, work remotely. And one of the most important things, and, and that's one of the things in my company from the beginning, um, it's uh, there's no culture for micromanagement in here. Uh, actually, anyone in my team that is not able to manage their own work, uh, manage their own tasks and be efficient, uh, then there's no point because I cannot be or any other manager cannot be uh, over everyone's shoulder. And uh, so the company grows slowly uh, and it's not a startup. It's, it's just a business and uh, I want it to grow slowly but steadily. So basically creating a team of talent that uh, is able to manage themselves uh, and decide if what they are doing uh, is good or, or bad. They don't need to depend. Sure, we... We share ideas and we share opinions and we test things, but uh, people themselves need to be able to um, to evaluate their uh, their work, uh, but also making uh, decisions. Not all decisions, but uh, most decisions related to their tasks. Because again, if that doesn't work in the office, it's not going to work. Actually, it's going to be a disaster. Uh, and it's management's fault always on these cases. Uh, if they can only work by micromanagement, uh, they can prepare to close the company if uh, if they need to to work remotely. So from the beginning, we decided uh, again the company was built uh, and started uh, during the, the beginning of COVID. So from the beginning, we decided there was only going to be laptops. We have some test servers on the office that are not laptops, but even our um, production machines for VR and uh, every 3D work uh, and every video work, they are all laptops. They might be a little bit more expensive, but we are ready for uh, remote work at any moment, uh, at any situation. Not just the equipment, but also the um, the, the staff, the, the team has to be ready to work remotely. And so far that's working very well. Uh, one thing that uh, probably most comp companies don't do, but if your employees, uh, so they have their laptop and they have, but uh, maybe they need a bigger screen to also work. Uh, so again, this is efficiency. If you, if you can invest in improving at least a little bit uh, your your employee's home office, even if they don't use it all the time, uh, you're not wasting money. Uh, and again, time is money in the end. So if their productivity is better when they work from home, uh, that's fine. So we actually have a, a policy and it's in our contract. Uh, anyone uh, can work from home if they want, unless uh, there's a meeting or something with the client that they need to be in the office. Uh, but actually, people prefer to work here, uh, except uh, for the work from home day. So we have a, a work from home day, which is Wednesdays. Every Wednesday, everyone works from home, uh, except me sometimes. Uh, but uh, so middle of the week, every Wednesday, uh, everyone works from home uh, again. It took a while in the beginning for everyone to get used to, especially people that were not used to work from home. But again, it's something that needs to be built uh, together. Uh, and people not, uh, are not going to get used to it uh, on their own. So they need help. So aside from the work from home day, the, every Wednesday, we have a, a work from home week every three months also. 
uh, and it works very well because again I want to be sure that everyone if there's let's hope not uh, any other similar situation uh, everyone can just take their laptops uh, uh, and connect to the servers on the on the office uh, and some of them on the cloud uh, and work as if nothing happened or as close to that as uh, possible so again we have a work uh, work from home day and we have a work from home week full week uh, every three months uh, the other thing is uh tools uh and again i already said that we have everything prepared uh so our task management uh, in our case we do our, all our uh, internal tools and some of them we end up uh, developing and uh, refining them to well to throw them on the market mostly for china but uh so our task management our uh, teamwork uh our uh, dashboard, uh, I can show it later. So everyone is aware of uh, what everyone else is doing uh, at any time and task dependencies, especially from people to people and all that stuff. So I don't really need to micromanage because everyone uh, can, uh, if they need any information or coordination, they, they, can, um, they can see the tasks everyone is working on. But again, there's plenty of software some free some paid uh, for that and any company should build their own uh, let's call it uh, what if this crap happens again uh, how are you going to work so they should build their infrastructure uh, to um, to be able to work from anywhere and, and for people to be able to communicate again efficiently uh, so work communication uh, and again in, in our case we build our own tools and we build some clients tools but uh, there's many ways to do this uh, there's plenty of stuff out, out there. Uh, so this, I, I, how are we in timing? Because yes, we are. We have a couple of minutes. Uh, okay, thank you, so Fernando, for, for your speech. Yes, uh, I think uh, I'm going back to the. I'm going back to the um, to the other uh, screen. Okay. Give me a second. Oh, I'm still you, here. you can see a contact on of uh, Fernando if you want to ask him some questions. Yeah, and if there's any if there's any questions now, it's also fine. Yeah, there is some questions. Okay, uh, so the first question is: uh, Thank you, Fernando. It was very interesting. I have a question. It's from Vladimir. Uh, what trends do you see in e-commerce? uh it depends uh it depends on the market basically so uh i mean china we we work for both uh markets uh we actually have a lot of um custom uh e-commerce platforms because i don't know if you are familiar with china but uh the the e-commerce platform here is taobao uh any um any factory any retailer can put their stuff there and it's kind of the lead but now it's shifting and that's one thing in china markets shift really quickly uh and people have to adapt so now there's more demand for custom uh online stores and custom features uh and even uh some some of the tools we, we are used on the west just don't really work here because they either uh, if they depend on google or some services it's all screwed but there's plenty of offers here but Clients are going even more for uh, very customized because they have their own uh, sometimes crazy ways of trying to do things. Uh, and um, so e-commerce, um, let me switch to the West now. Uh, e-commerce is quite developed at this point, both the, using the usual tools that are accessible to everyone, uh, be it Shopify or whatever uh it's a little bit polluted with the same products on uh, ten thousand different stores most of them coming from china actually uh we make jokes about that here because like the stuff you you get on aliexpress it's stuff that is manufactured to sell to the west and the price in aliexpress it's like absurd it's like 10 times more than you can find it in taobao uh because that's stuff that consumers here don't usually buy like cheaper stuff because the point is to resell them uh because the how to say the middle class uh went way up on this since i'm here on the last less than 10 years i saw a huge difference so people now are very uh uh 
uh, consumers here are insane. They, they buy the most expensive phones. Uh, I don't buy a new iPhone every year. Uh, every Chinese people I know will buy a new, uh, the new iPhone every year, for example. Uh, it's insane. So people are going for higher quality and uh, even if the price is higher, uh, which was something I was surprised when I arrived in China because I had a completely different idea. But one thing, again, on e-commerce, here, now you, you see all kinds of, uh, not just uh, B2B and B2C stuff, but you see all kinds of concepts of uh, market. And again, because everything here is by numbers, uh, everything here is by numbers. If, if a concept works, then it just explodes. So stuff like uh, directly uh, customized, uh, directly to the factory, doesn't go to retailers, doesn't go to middle, any kind of middleman. Uh, and uh, for example, the factory has some kind of uh, customization interface and the clients just buy directly. That is exploding here now. Uh, so for, mm -hmm. uh, eco for example, here uh, in the West, we use computers a lot, right? Here, everything is through mobile phone. The, the computer uh, for consuming internet, it's not an existent, but it's uh, really low. And even not on mobile phone, it will be inside the WeChat application, so inside the WeChat browser and the WeChat apps and so on. One thing that is going insane here is um, influencer market, because again, if you put a product, and that, that is even working with the products from the West, uh, because again, things from the West are kind of, uh, how to say, they see it as a luxury, uh, especially if it's not very common. Uh, even if it's expensive, doesn't matter. So if it if a product is put on the on show from the right uh, influencer and the right product from the right influencer, we're not talking about hundreds. We're not talking about thousands. We're, we're talking about millions of orders. So it's uh, then there's a problem of scale because some companies try to do it. For example, some small countries like Portugal trying to sell uh, certain wines which are expensive, but uh, then they, 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 they don't get uh, <laughs> enough products to, to sell, especially coming from a small country or a small company. Uh, it's impossible. Again, it, 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 it's completely, that's one of the reasons I like to be here. These things change all the time and you need to adapt all the time. You don't get bored. It's impossible. Uh, in, more, I'm kind of going in different directions with my, question uh, not with my question with my answer but uh well but you question, are, it's it's very interesting information you were sharing with us no because uh, I, i'll just add one thing i don't know if i have time uh do i have time you have a couple of minutes and we have also three questions but i will try to gather them to one question <laughs> okay so so no. the question will be um, is it hard to create a new brand during dark times and surpass strong competitors? Uh, and how uh, soon did you manage to get new clients with your new agency? And how to be successful in uh, 2022? Okay. Uh, as I said, uh, it was not that hard. Um... Again, it was not that hard. The hardest part was just the paperwork, but that is to open a company anywhere. But in China, if you are a foreigner, it's uh, different. And again, middle of COVID, most of the offices were only opened uh, uh, a, f uh, a few times per, uh, per week, like two days per week, uh, with all the masks and stuff, uh, things at the time. That only lasts like three, four months in here, at least that was good. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Aside from paperwork and stuff, the building the brand and building the company, uh, I had some uh, some work started because I had my own brand and my own clients. But again, I had to. Some of them were projects from ten years ago, and I never contacted them again. I just said, "Well, I have a team now, so we can do more stuff and faster." Uh, and some of them actually had projects uh, pretty soon. But uh, I was chasing both markets, both the Western uh, and both here. Here again, uh, there were so many companies that had to reinvent themselves that there was too much uh, 
uh, market. In the West, it was more difficult because the time that COVID uh, hits, people were being really careful with budgets and everything. Uh, but the same happened again. Uh, and this is not e-commerce directly related. It's more services. But uh, again, there were so many companies that lost half of their team or uh, key people on their teams uh, that needed to outsource. Uh, so again, I kind of adapted my services to the things that I knew that uh, were going to be needed. Um, uh, now it's kind of waking up again. It's still a, a little bit messy. But uh, one thing I keep getting is uh, basically custom e-commerce uh, system. So not using Magento, not using the Shopify. Because sooner or later, depends on the company and it depends on the scope of their business. But sometimes they end up, uh, okay, this has too much stuff that I don't need and it's just on the way. And this has a lot of stuff that I would like to have, but uh, but I can do. Sure, you can uh, you can build plugins, you can expand things, but some clients just decide to go and do their own custom thing. Um, and again, they come uh, because they know I have the company in China. They are expecting it to be really cheap. But again, that that time is over when, uh, and it's not because I'm a foreigner. Because good professionals in China actually earn the same as better in some cases I know than uh, good professionals in uh, in the West, in Europe or in the US. So uh, that is over the, the low the, the low labor cost uh, age that was 20 years ago, 30 years ago. So that's why, uh, but it, it, to anyone, well, now it's not the time to recommend anyone to travel anyway, but if anyone uh, has the wrong idea of China, because I know now the propaganda is all Chinese bad, Chinese this. I didn't have huge expectations when I came, uh, but yes, I had that uh, the usual media about uh, China. I was not expecting it to be what it is. I'm still lectured by friends and family even telling me uh, China is this way, China is that way, but they never came here. I'm the one living here for 10 years. But again, that works because people are convinced that China is, a, is not a developed country, that it's a mixture of countries in Africa with North Korea. And then I keep listening to the same crap, like the authoritarian regime and the dictatorship. Bullshit, no. again, that's the right word. Uh, so I, I really love, not now because no one can come here now and until things are sorted out outside of China, but I really love when someone, either for business or for tourism, comes here and they get completely shocked with, okay, this is not exactly the, the China was expecting. You guys don't use money. Uh, it's just uh, WeChat and you just scan a code for everything. Most of the stores don't accept money anymore. Even someone selling fruit on the street will use uh, WeChat. Uh, I didn't touch money for, what, three years, four years? I think that helped also with COVID because money is probably one of the things that everyone touches yes. trillions of times. I think that that helped a little bit. But again, they get shocked with those things. They get shocked with the, the infrastructure. They, they get shocked with the people buying outrageously expensive stuff on expensive shopping centers. They were expecting it to be like miserable and everyone asking, begging for food on the streets or something, but it's not. And for and business- what's about what's about air pollution? Uh, that, I don't know if they, if they still throw that crap on the news all the time. It was very normal, but like, since 2014, more or less, uh, right now, uh, well, during COVID, there was none because uh, factories were closed and everything. But oh. right now, it's like you have a bad day uh, every month, sometimes sometimes not even that, and it's a couple of hours. In two until 2014, it was really bad. Then it, uh, it got, again, here when they take decisions, they solve them quickly. Uh, and now, again, that's a, another example of... Uh, the the windmill and the building the wall and the building a windmill uh, now china is not only solving their problems but they are exporting the solutions because uh, uh wind energy solar energy uh, and all kinds of solutions they came out with for factories and everything they are the ones selling it to other countries now now hmm. now it's funny because the other countries don't want to implement it most of the times but it's yeah, interesting yeah. so even my country so the energy company of my country, of Portugal, now belongs to China, actually. Uh, so it was bought by a conglomerate. So solar panels in south of Portugal are everywhere, all Chinese companies. Uh, wind, uh, electric windmills, all Chinese companies. So they are taking over the energy industry. 
Uh, and again, it's one of those, if you don't move fast, you lose the market. That applies yes. to energy, yes. that applies to e-commerce, that applies to everything. Again, it's being on the look for things changing because there's always opportunities there. That, that was what my talk was about mostly. And I used that already twice. Again, 2008 was the same crap all over again. The only difference was that, well, now we had the travel uh, restrictions and again, it affects people's health and life in some cases. Uh, but uh, again, it's a shitty market situation affected by this. Uh, and either you adapt and you thrive or uh, you, you cry and uh, nothing happens. <laughs> Again. I think yeah. anyway, if we can't uh, travel uh, right now in case <laughs> of COVID, we can also uh, always travel to Metaverse. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Nowadays. Well, uh, yeah, we're we're messing a lot. If you look behind me, there's two yeah. VR headsets. If you look even that way, wait a second, there's even a motion, motion simulator chair that connects to oh. VR. Uh, yeah, this is like NASA. We have all kinds of guys. Again, I'm in China. We just go to the, the gadget district, which is like the size of a Portuguese city. And each building is like either just graphics cards or VR gloves or... Uh, so each building has something or, or printers or phones or whatever. So we want to test cool. with any technology. Uh, you take two hours to pick whatever you want and you don't need to order anything on AliExpress and test it. You just go there and pick it. And, uh, or even if you buy it in Taobao next day, uh, is in your door or, uh, JD Jindong, uh, the same day it's at your door, whatever gadget, whatever, uh, whatever thing. So for anyone who spends a lot of money in gadgets, don't come to China. It's, it's your disgrace. Uh, <laughs> no, that's a surprise because I think everyone uh, who is not from China thinking that uh, there is some kind of anecdotic USSR uh, with many no. of communists on oh. the streets and polluted air and no, uh, that's, factories. No, no, no. That's, that's what the... How to say? There's way too many countries, starting with the US, that don't like the idea that another country is surpassing them. So then oh, yes. It's, yes. it's just political bullshit. I, I stay away from that. Uh, but uh, again, I get tired and I don't even try to discuss that topic because people that never lived in China or never even came to China uh, will win the discussion. Uh, and I don't have patience to even <laughs> come to China, see China and then decide for yourself. Uh, because that's the I only think, way. I think I will. It's one of those countries. It's one of those countries. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Fernando, for your speech. Uh, thank you for your I answers. hope it was not too boring. <laughs> no, it, it was great. It was really great. I see and someone mentioning Alibaba, but Alibaba is still also for the yes. West. So the prices will be inflated. It's not the prices you find in here. The, <laughs> the only bad thing of living in China is when you go home, you are complaining about the cost of everything every, every second, uh, especially gadgets, services. Uh, your phone bill, your, um, and then you go insane and you don't buy anything at home because, you know, oh, I can buy it for a tenth of the price, the same product, mm. you know, where the factory is or uh, where the direct from factory is. Because don't forget that all the Western brands, they have their factories here. Uh, yes, yes. And one of the reasons for them to be able to open is that they cannot overinflate the prices for the Chinese market. Even on Steam, uh, the games are not charged at the same price in China because the consumer yes. market is so huge, no one would buy it and uh, another store would open and would get the market. I know, in so Steam, uh, you know, <laughs> we are from Belarus. Uh, oh, no, I'm from Belarus. And uh, we, in Steam, we have even different uh, prices from uh, Russia. So we mm -hmm. have more higher prices in Steam than Russia. Really? Well, yeah. in here I'm quite happy. I'm not a gamer, but I times. download a lot of stuff to test and everything, mostly VR. Uh, but uh, the price in here is usually uh, between five and ten percent of the price uh, of the normal price. But it's oh, a huge Jesus. market. They, they sell by the number. They sell by volume. Uh, I understand. So you you also have Genshin Impact uh, game in Which China. One? Genshin Impact. Uh, 
Uh, I'm it's, not the gamer guy. It's too, it's too half past two a.m. Otherwise, uh, one of my uh, guys in here. It's is like the gamer it's like one. the most uh, famous online uh, game from China right now. Uh, th and there's they so have, many people are crazy. They, they people have are billions of dollars already. Uh, <laughs> people here use their devices a lot, uh, and especially on the yeah. subway or if they are waiting, they will be playing some game. I have no idea sometimes what games there are, and the, the trend changes every year or every month or every week sometimes. And this is but, this uh, is a mobile RPG. Uh, here, if it cannot run on mobile, it won't hit the market that well. <laughs> uh, but they had these. Uh, even that went out of fashion again. Things change all the time. The um, the PC gaming houses, which was like imagine a, a huge place with like three thousand PCs and guys with headphones playing uh, games all night. Sometimes uh, there was some uh, government crackdown because people are <laughs> really getting addicted, uh, especially kids like fourteen year olds. Uh, oh, yeah. But uh, then during COVID, that, that had to close, and people found other markets. So then people switched to mobile, basically. Uh, and now that doesn't have any market at all. So there's still some of those uh, houses, mostly in the countryside, but in big cities, no one goes there now. Everyone switched to mobile. Uh, everyone uh, changed their uh, monetizing strategy on games or on anything. Uh, and again, here it's like you, you need to, to go with the flow because things change really quickly and uh, if you miss the train, you're out. Yes, totally. So you, if you are interested, you can uh, find on Google uh, the MiHoYo studio. They are making that Genshin. That Chinese. That sounds Mi, Korean. MiHoYo. It's, it's, uh, maybe it's about my maybe pronunciation. Maybe it's not exactly that. <laughs> It doesn't sound <laughs> Chinese at all. <laughs> but it, it's writing like me, ho, yo. So, uh, uh, we're out of our time uh, already. Um, Sorry. Thank you, Fernanda. <laughs> One more time. Thank you. I hope we will meet on our um, other events. It was okay. very interesting. Uh, and uh, have a good night. <laughs> I, I hope you will sleep now. well. I, I don't know how many coffees I already have. <laughs> I was trying to survive until 2 a.m., but I went oh, overboard. God. Like at oh, 10, God. I already had too much coffee. Uh, so I have no idea. Uh, I'm not going to stay in the office for sure. I'm going home soon. But uh, it, was, it, it was good. I'm happy that all the technical stuff didn't fail. Like the, neither the green screen, neither anything. Uh, but anyway, uh, this was interesting. And uh, if you yes, have any other events yes. you'd, you'd want me to participate, just let me know. Everyone saw my contact. I can put it back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The website is being changed because we're putting the case studies from this year. The website from last year was really basic. But we work mostly B2B, so we didn't even do much advertising this year uh because well we try to do a good job so clients bring other clients and clients being bring more uh, more projects so it's working fine so far again and this was all built in the middle of the pandemic uh again now it's fine in here everything is normal for quite a while but um again it's not impossible to do crazy things like opening a company and building a, a team and uh, recruiting talent and curating talent uh, even during these times so it's better than just crossing your arms and uh, complain uh, or blame the anyway uh i'll go back to my anyway if you will have any questions you can write to fernanda so yeah. and now now we will finish <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll still okay. be seeing. Yeah, have a good night, Fernando. Not yet. <laughs> you but can try. ask questions try. during the. You can ask questions during the next ten hours because I won't be asleep for sure. <laughs> okay, so I <laughs> wish you a good night. Good yeah. night, everyone. Yeah. Good night.